Welcome okay. everybody. We're happy to have you here. Uh, and we're happy to be here at PyCon France. Um, welcome to Azure to Blockchain in 30 Minutes Lecture. Um, my name is uh, Karin Bell, and I'm a software developer in a startup called uh, Clear, Clear Blockchain Technologies, and I'm also the co-manager of Israel's largest community of female engineers. Hello, I'm Jonathan. I'm also a software developer, and I've been one for most of my life. In the past couple of years, I've mainly been a CTO as a service, which means I meet founders who want to build a startup, and I set up their technology so they can go live as quickly as possible. Today, we are going to build a blockchain from scratch in 30 minutes in Python. What we hope to accomplish by doing this is going over many of the main concepts of a blockchain and how it works, while diving into many of the details uh, well in, uh, deep enough to implement them. We aren't going to go over 100% of the security concerns or implementation details, uh, though we will uh, touch many of them. Use this, okay. And uh, we also won't give any investment advice. So to start us off, let's all assume that we don't trust banks. So the inventors of blockchain don't trust banks for many reasons. But we're going to focus today on a specific reason, which is that a bank is a single organization. It means that for a hacker, it's a single target. And for us, it's one organization that can decide whether to approve or disapprove our transactions, which can be pretty annoying for some people. So let's start by taking a look on what a bank is for us. And uh, so on the left, you can see the interface of a bank, and this is the interface we are going to uh, uh, implement with a blockchain instead. And in this video, we're going to use pseudo live coding, which means we are using a video. And uh, you can see on the left, the bank has our financial data saved in one place, and we can make a transaction. For example, I can send Karin Bell 50 coins, and we can calculate a balance. For example, we can see how much money Karin Bell has right now. Uh, we will use PyTest Watch, which runs our PyTests every time we save a file. That's on the right. And on the left, you can see. Oh, you can't see. Oh, no. That's terrible. <laughs> so you can't see. Oh, no. We'll, we'll figure it out. Come, come see. Video. Switch what? Uh, this is a video. <laughs> so we can try. But don't tell anyone. Uh, yeah, turning off lights is great. You don't need to see us. No. Any ideas? I need to see a lot of shots. That's the thing, Susan. Can you see now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit better. Okay. So uh, we'll tell you what's going on on the left so you can use your imagination really well. Uh, so on the left, we have a test function which we'll use to, uh, to use the, the example interface that we are building throughout the lecture. And as I said, every time we'll save the file, then we'll see the test running. So in the basic implementation, we have a bank. And what we actually want to have is nodes. And we want those nodes to have the same functionality as the bank. And we want to be able to have to give everyone nodes. So we will have a node for Alice and a node for Bob. And then we, when we want an, a node for everyone who wants to participate. And when we actually look at the interface, we actually want the node to have the same methods be implemented, like the bank. So we want to make transaction and calculate balance and so on and so forth. OK, so let's look at, the, at what we actually want to happen here. So we have two nodes, and we want Alice to be able to transfer money for Bob. And so she'll do it from her own address to Bob's address. And let's say she's going to transfer about 50 coins. And then afterwards, we want to be able to calculate, uh, calculate Alice's balance and see that it's correct. Let's make this pass. So the, each node needs an address. Let, uh, we are going to give them pseudo-random address uh, from uh, 0 to to 999, but in a real blockchain, we'd use an address based on a private public key pair. Okay. 
Um, what else? OK. One of the main challenges when we have lots of nodes and each one of them saves our financial data, instead of saving it in only one place, is how do we update someone? For example, if I send Karin Bell money, you all need to know how much money uh, we both have right now. So we'll make a... We'll make a class called transaction. This transaction is going to have a from address, a to address, and a number of coins I want to transfer. Mm, OK. Haha. -ha. So you're going to have a network of nodes that all keep their financial data. And every time you make a transaction, you'll send a transaction class to each other. I know what I'll do. I'll make my fake transaction saying that Karin Bell is sending me all of her money. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> so in order to stop Jonathan from using, abusing our system, we're going to create another class. We'll call it a signed transaction. And what this class will hold is a transaction and a signature, which we ultimately want to, have to be a, a crypt cryptographic signature that would verify that I uh, signed the transaction myself. Let's use this. So every one of the nodes, every one of us, is going to save a list of the signed transactions we know about. When we make a transaction, we'll make a new transaction class from the address sending to the address receiving with the amount of coins. Then we'll sign this transaction by the sender, so it will be unfakeable. And then we'll keep this new signed transaction in our list. Let's implement the sign method. For our example, we'll just sign by saving the string signed by. But in a, a real blockchain, we'd use a digital signature uh, using our private public key pair, which is unfa unfakeable. But same idea. And when we calculate balance, then, for example, I'm calculating Karin Bell's balance. So I'll start by assuming she has zero coins, and then I'll go over all the signed transactions. And if this transaction gave her money, if it's to her, I'll add this to her balance. If the address is to her, add this to the balance. And if this transaction says that she paid, it's from her, then I'll reduce this from her balance. For example, if she paid 50 coins. And then I'll return the balance calculators. OK. So we, we can see this test passes. And we actually want to see now that Alice's balance is correct. So we're going to assert that Alice's balance is worth what? We haven't decided how much money she's going to start from. We, we only know she gave Bob 50 coins. So we're going to initialize the first node uh, with an initial amount. We can implement different ways of in initializing the amount of coins in, the, in our blockchain. And we'll initialize it with 200 coins. So let's implement this. So we'll give a, an initial coins a optional a param for the constructor, which will only be used for the first node. We should definitely validate that also. And if we got an initial amount of coins, we'll make a first transaction to symbolize that this node has that, those coins. From who? From none. We need to make sure this is the only transaction from none. It's the first one. Uh, containing, for example, 50 coins, and sign this transaction, which is starting off our blockchain, and save this new signed transaction in our list of signed transactions. Now we can go back to the test and verify that Alice has 150 coins, and we can also verify in the same way that Bob has 50 coins. So this works, and we're happy about our new system. This is cool. Okay. Haha. -ha. <laughs> OK, so you have a network of nodes now where every time you make a transaction, you send each other a signed transaction class. And I can't fake the signature of the sender, but I still know what I'll do. Oh, nice, we have lights. OK. I have 1,000 coins. I'm going to send a Karin Bell and one of you, who are in our network, 1,000 coins each, even though I don't have so much. Whoops. And each one of them will give me in exchange a shiny new laptop. They won't know how to handle this conflict, but I'll stay with two shiny new laptops. Ha, 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 ha. OK, so we want to find a way to avoid from being cheated like this by Jonathan or by any other evil person. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to define a new, a new thing in our system. We're going to call it a history state. And we'll say that each time we want to make a transaction, we'll verify we're on the same history state. And every time we want to make a new transaction, we're going to create a new history state that is based on the previous one. Now, every transaction I'm going to make is going to assume a specific history state. And if this history state is not the current one, we're not going to make it happen. But instead of calling it a history state chain, we can call it blockchain. So that's all a blockchain is. Let's implement this. So we have a, we're going to have a new class called a block, which will contain a pointer to the previous block. For example, block three will point at block two, and also contain the new signed transaction added for this block, this new history state. We won't anymore save the list of signed transactions. We will save our blockchain, which means we, for this we only need to save the last block because it points at the ones beforehand. When we initialize uh, our blockchain, then instead of just creating our first signed transaction, we will create our first block. So let's create a block for this signed transaction, pointing at our previous block, which is null at the beginning. None. Let's implement create block, which gets a signed transaction in the previous block and simply creates a new instance of the class for now. And we need to save this block as our last block. When we make a transaction, we won't only make a signed transaction class. We'll make, a, for example, one block two, we'll create block three, containing our new signed transaction and pointing at the last block, for example, block two, and then save this block as our last block. And when we calculate balance, we can't iterate the list of signed transactions because we don't have a list of signed transactions. We'll iterate the blocks. So let's start from the last block. And while the current block isn't none, get the signed transaction from the block and iterate black back one block. And uh, notice that the test that passed before still passes now, but we save the data in blocks instead of a list of signed transactions. Cool. So another part of what we said before is that we want to be able to verify that everyone uh, is on the same page. So we want to make also sure that Bob knows our balance. And Bob currently doesn't know it, so we're going to create a new function. We'll call it pull blockchains from other nodes so Bob can, can know the other blockchain as we are. But the problem is that Bob doesn't know who are the other nodes yet, right? So we're going to initialize all the new nodes in the network with a list of other nodes. This is just one way to implement this. And currently in the, in the network, there's only node Alice. So Bob is going to receive a list that contains node Alice. Let's implement this. So in our constructor, if it's not the first node, then we'll get the list of other nodes that already exist. We'll save the list of other nodes, which are nodes. At the beginning, they are empty. But if we got any, uh, we should verify this is only if not for the first node. Then we'll save the other nodes we got, in our example, Alice, in our list of other nodes. Then when we pull block blockchains from other nodes, for example, when Bob wants to know from Alice what her blockchain is, what will we do? We'll iterate over all the other nodes we know about. Uh, and we'll check what the last node, what the blockchain is of that other node. For example, what's Alice's blockchain? But we also have our own blockchain. So how do we decide which blockchain to use? OK. So the easy case is when, so first of all, what we already said is that we're going to ask everyone, what is the entire history you know about, which is our last block? So if we all agree on the same block, everything is easy, right? We can just take one, it's the same one, whatever. But let's say that I say I know blockchain A. And I say I know blockchain B. So we can either fight about it, which I feel comfortable with, or we can talk about it. Let's talk, honey. OK, so let's create an algorithm. So. In this scenario, this is the first scenario, I have a blockchain which is an obvious continuation of Jonathan's blockchain. How could this happen? So this could happen if Jonathan is just being slow to be updated on the rest of the blocks, right? I'm slow, honey. 
Okay, so in this scenario, we just want Jonathan to be, get updated and get all the rest of the blocks that he hasn't heard about yet. So we just take the longer chain. Let's implement this. Okay, so which block to pick? So we are going to implement the naive solution of taking the longer chain. So if the length, the size of the block of the other node is longer than the size of our blockchain, then we will set our blockchain to be the other blockchain. This is the naive solution. Yeah. Ah, and let's implement block.size. Um, okay. So by default, the size is zero, and then we'll uh, loop backwards on the blocks, and every time there's another block to go back, we'll add one to the size. Of course, this can also be done with recursion. Okay, cool. So we have a solution for this scenario, and we know we just take the longer chain. And now the tests pass, which is also cool. Note that Bob knows the balance of the network. Okay, so this was scenario one. Scenario two is that we still have different blockchains, but you can see now that my blockchain is not a continuation of Jonathan's. We just diverged in this scenario. How can this happen? So Jonathan can still be slow to be updated, well, but this can, al can also happen if someone is trying to be fraudulent. How can someone use this in a fraudulent way? Ha, ha, ha. I know what I'll do. You simply pick the longer blockchain when you pull blockchains from other nodes. So I'll take your real blockchain on the bottom, which contains all your financial history, and I'll, re I'll tell you that the real blockchain is the red blockchain on top, which contains almost nothing. And your blockchain might say that I paid people one million coins, but if you believe me that my top blockchain is the true one, then all of your financial history will be deleted and void. <laughs> but Jonathan, we already decided that we take the longer chain. This would not work for you. You think that would stop me? <laughs> I'll just make a really long chain, and still I'll delete all your financial history, and then I would make one million <laughs> coins. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how can we stop evil people like Jonathan from doing something like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to make it very, very hard to create new blocks. Cool. So assuming that Jonathan has less computing resources from the entire network, we're gonna make it we're gonna make it hard and we're gonna make it hard to create each block, then us, the whole legitimate network, will create blocks faster than Jonathan. So how can we make a specific block creation very hard? So here's a word on hashes. A hash is a function that takes a number, like, the num uh, like i on the left, and returns a number like the numbers on the right. The interesting about, thing about hashes is that I cannot predict which number i will return a specific result. So if I make a hash on a block and i, and have, then I, if I have a condition on the result of hash of block and i, then I need to iterate through the i's until I, f I find an i that returns a solution that answers my condition. Like here, my condition is uh, lower than 100. So I'll ha have to iterate through 0, 1, until I get to a i that hash on block and i will return the number 0, lower than 100. Is it smaller? OK, so let's implement making sure that everyone who creates a new block also finds the correct i. So we're, our i will call it magic number, or we'll put it in our class block, and we'll say if you want to create a new block, you need to find this magic number. And we'll make a method, validate block, which is going to make sure that the correct hash was found, so a non block isn't valid. And then we'll calculate the hash of this block using, this, uh, using hashlib. 
And then we'll check if the hash, if the first digit is zero, we'll say, okay, the block is valid. And we can, use, we can also do several other validations to a block, like making sure the, the nobody has a negative amount of money or so. Let's use this. When we create a new block, then we are going to have to find the correct magic number. So let's start with magic number zero. And then while the block isn't valid yet, we'll try a higher i. This is where it forces us to look through lots of magic numbers, which takes computing power. Um, okay. Oh, spoiler. <laughs> so assuming that we have more computing resources than Jonathan, then we know that we will always have a longer chain than Jonathan that wants to cheat us. Ha ha ha. So you think you have more computers than me, and I won't be able to make a blockchain faster than you. Think again. I just get lots of computers from Amazon, and I'll make a, a, a blockchain faster than yours, and again, I'll delete all your financial history. You're doomed. OK, so how can we prevent this thing from happening? So what we want to do is to incentivize people to join our network. And by joining our network, ha we'll all have together more computers than Jonathan. And then we'll beat him. So the way for us to incentivize them is by giving them coins. So everyone that creates a block now gets a coin. So everyone's, everyone wants to join us and create new blocks. So, <laughs> so, 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 so. so now people will join us from around the world and we'll have a big network that can defeat Jonathan. Let's implement this. So when we create a new block, we'll save which address created this block because we want to give them a PyCon coin. When we, in our method create block, we'll save our address so that we'll get this PyCon coin. And when we calculate how much balance someone has, for example, how much balance Karim Bell has, then we're iterating over all the blocks. And we checked for each block if she sent money or received money, but now we'll also check if this address created the block. And if so, add one to their balance. Notice the test failed because now Alice has a, a two more blocks, the initial block and the one for the transaction. So she has 152 coins, not just 150. And the tests pass. Okay, cool. So now we have a lot of people creating more and more, more blocks and preventing evil people from destroying all our financial history. When this happens, then what actually happened in the world is that when you are paid to create blocks, everyone creates blocks, and then the whole world is full of people mining bitcoins. <laughs> yes, so this is a, a, a real title. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we haven't talked, as we said before, we haven't talked about all the things, but what we have talked is about how, how blockchain is basic, basically works, it's a typical type of uh, blockchain and what are the general methods that we have to use and how we uh, incentivize people to join our network. Some things we didn't touch are some of the uh, uh, block validations, like making sure there's only one initial block. And we would use a private public key pair, as we said, for digital signatures. And we could also implement the network connectivity protocol. But this, is, this does contain quite a big chunk of what a blockchain does. And when we say a big chunk, we also mean that it is a lot of what is written in the Bitcoin's white paper, which you are very welcome to read. It's pretty readable and enjoyable and whatever is your kick. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Done. <laughs>